Okay, hi there and welcome to an update video on aspects of financial regulation in the UK. This is a companion video to a previous one on aspects of financial market failure. Let's take a few moments, a few minutes just to run through, to work through the key agencies that regulate the UK financial system. You need to know who these agencies are. So a quick line or two on each. The FPC, the Financial Policy Committee, is run by the Bank of England. Their main job is to monitor and, if needed, to take action to reduce any systemic risk that might threaten the resilience of the entire financial system. They take a look at the financial system as a whole, big sense, see if they can maintain the stability of the system, the risk factors in that financial network. The Prudential Regulation Authority, what an exciting name that is. They have a particular focus on the solvency commercial viability, if you like, of specific financial markets, such as insurance or uh, people who let, uh, buy, lend to buy to let investors or credit unions. Uh, okay, and the Financial Conduct Authority is basically there to protect consumers. Very much in the news over the years, they have been targeting the mis-selling of PPI, They've been having the right go at the uh, payday lending industries with interest rate, interest rate charge caps. Uh, they've been uh, trying to promote effective competition in the banking sector. Uh, just recently, they've got a cap on the interest that the rent to own market can charge. So their job is really to look at the financial aspects of particular industries or markets. I put a little well, big blue line underneath those three. The Competition and Marks Authority, of course, is the UK's main uh, monopoly um, commissioner, monopoly uh, scrutiny, if you like, they have a much wider remit that, that extends way beyond financial markets. But they do have a role to play. For example, looking at mergers and takeovers in the banking sector, or mergers and takeovers in, in the building society industries, preventing, uh, looking at the interests of consumers and preventing market power being dominated. So those are the agencies that regulate what are the aims of, of financial um, policy? Well, the aim is to be contributing towards financial stability. Go back to the video, the previous video on financial market failure. The externalities of a financial system doesn't work. So their job is to prevent, protect against the consequences of market failure, to protect the interests of consumers as key stakeholders. So in a sense, trying to limit the power of the banking, the established banks, protect vulnerable households from very high interest rates on, for example, payday loans, try to make financial services more affordable, accessible and also understood. And oftentimes balancing the interests of consumers who may not have that sophisticated knowledge about financial instruments, both saving and debt, compared to the people that they're trying to, who are trying to sell them financial services. More generally, they're trying to provide, it, if you like, an underpinning of confidence in the system, to allow the central bank, if it needs to, to perform its other function as lender of last resort. And this key concept, absolutely crucial concept, to try and prevent or mitigate systemic risk. Now, if you talk about systemic risk in an essay, you are on very, very firm ground. So what does it mean? Systemic risk is a great phrase to use, which talks about the possibility that an event at a micro level for example, the failure of a, of, of a bank or a big insurance company could actually trigger a much wider systemic consequence, negative consequence. Only a decade ago, the global financial crisis illustrated just how interconnected the world has become, has become. A shock in one industry in one country, the subprime market, mortgage market in the United States, for example, had huge reverberations across the world threatening the stability of the entire global financial system. Since the crisis, there's been a big shift towards trying to make the banking system in particular less fragile, more resilient, less vulnerable to those shocks. It's the nature of the beast that banks, commercial banks, have to take risks. Some of those risks will go wrong. Sometimes a bank will lend you money and you can't pay it back. But uh, the, 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 the supervisors, the regulators have a job to make sure that banks can absorb losses without just keening over. So financial regulation seeks to control the degree of systemic risk in a country. There are two main types of financial regulation policy, and it's fantastic if you know what both are, uh, so you can really impress 
the A-level examiners. The first set of policies are known as micro-prudential policies, and that the aim there, at a micro level, is to try and increase the resilience and the stability of individual industries and firms, commercial banks, payday lenders, insurance companies, protect depositors, protect the people who save with the bank, protect the people who borrow with the bank. That is micro-prudential. Prudential, I suppose, means safety, doesn't it? Being prudent. Macro-prudential seeks to safeguard the financial system as a whole to protect against systemic risk. Now, one of the key parts of this is so-called risk assessment. And this quote is from Sir John Cunliffe at the Bank of England. Tail end risk is the focus of financial regulation. Financial stability is about the tail of the probability distribution. In other words, not what could happen. Sorry, what about what could happen rather than what is likely to happen? It is unlikely that Newcastle United will win the Premier League. It is unlikely that my club, Harrogate Town, will win the Football League. Those are tail end events. They are events of low probability. Uh, they're not the central forecast. But of course, tail end risk is what happened just over a decade ago. The, the likelihood of the big subprime collapse in the United States. The likelihood of huge movements in exchange rates and currencies. Those are the extreme events, which oftentimes the modelers and the forecasters don't build into their risk assessments. That's one of the big changes in the last 10 years. As a result, and this is fantastic for the exam, the UK Bank of England, along with other central banks now, uh, each year performs what is called a stress test. Now, a stress test is not what you have to do before the exam. The exam is your stress test. But what the Bank of England does here is they paint a really, really bad scenario, a kind of doomsday picture. And they ask a very simple question. Can banks, in this case in the UK, can the UK banking system as a whole, can it withhold and withstand and survive a really adverse scenario? Okay, Do the banks have sufficient reserves and resilience to withstand a shock? This is the 2018 stress test scenario. They assume the world economy goes into recession. They assume that China goes into recession, that GDP falls in the UK by 5%, unemployment more than doubles. There's a third fall in property prices. Huge fall in commercial real estate prices of shops and shopping centres, buildings and offices. The pound falls by nearly 30% and base interest rates go up to 4% from where they are now, 0.75. In other words, the stress test is a what if. It's the most pessimistic scenario the bank is prepared to tolerate. And they test to see if the banks have enough reserves. And the answer is that the banks do have, in the UK, enough capital to withstand this shock. The yellow bit here is the stress test for 2018, matched against what actually happened during the financial crisis. So they're assuming a much bigger rise in unemployment, a big, bigger collapse in residential property prices, for example. The good news is, as of 2018, that commercial banks in the UK, all of them, are able to withstand the slump and are ready, if you like, for the uncertainty, perhaps, of a disorderly Brexit. And the United States banks last year passed the stress test as well. So this is an example of financial stability policies at work. The banks also brought in something, this is a bit technical, but if you understand it, it's fantastic. It's something called the counter-cyclical capital buffer, best said with an American accent. The idea is basically that the, the amount of capital that banks have should go counter-cyclical. So when the credit cycle is swinging nicely when there's a lot of a lot of extra borrowing and people are confident and wanting to take out mortgages then the banks should build up extra capital maybe they should issue some new shares perhaps they could go to the bond markets they can raise some extra capital because that's often often the time when banks become a little bit loose and a bit uh, relaxed about who they're lending to so it's good for them to build capital during that time period there's a phrase that says they should always try and mend the the roof when the sun is shining rather than when it's pouring down. That's really what the idea is here. So that if there was a downswing in the economy, if there's a recession, if the credit cycle turns, then banks have some capital to help absorb a loss. So that's currently set at 1%. They think the banks have to hold an extra 1% of their assets in capital um, at the moment. Lots, lots of other examples of financial regulation and action. 
um, in the mortgage market now the lenders have a limit to how big the mortgage lend loans can be I think it's 15 percent of any new mortgage lending can be lent out at a ratio of four and a half times your income I think only about one sixth of a new mortgage lending by by a bank or a building society can be a mortgage worth four and a half times some of this income in other words they're trying to limit how much mortgage lenders are prepared or able to lend out what that means of course is that uh, people now need to save more for a deposit which makes it harder to get a mortgage there were deposit guarantees in place now to protect savers and so when the northern rock went bust there were fears that savers would lose their money deposit guarantees now provide a bit of resilience for savers we've talked about stress tests insurance companies must now have enough capital to cope with a one in 200 year event such as maybe the government getting its Brexit deal through something that's extremely unlikely and interestingly in the certain interest rate markets the payday lenders were capped the rates of interest they could charge were capped I think it was 1% interest per day and that's actually led to a lot of payday lenders leaving the market similarly capped interest charges in the rent to own market that's people renting a sofa renting a TV in, in installments before eventually owning it looking into 2019 not everything is hunky-dory there are some quite big um, risks to the UK economy financial stability in particular people are worried about high levels of unsecured debt particularly in the in the car market there are obviously fears about a possible disorderly Brexit whenever if ever that happens uh, the no deal scenario for example how much further does the current property market surge have to go some evidence that property prices are now falling in places like London uh, will UK sorry will foreign investors still want to to invest in the UK don't forget we run a big current account deficit and therefore there's quite a big fear that foreign investors may lose some of their appetite for buying UK government bonds and property and shares UK banks are quite heavily exposed to the world economy so if the Chinese economy goes into a downspin if Germany goes into a recession perhaps some UK banks who've lent to people and businesses in those countries might face some some bad debts and there's the underlying problem is that the banks are still paying out billions for the legacy effects of their misconduct the misselling of PPI being an obvious example the financial system is on on the surface appears relatively stable but there are some risks just to be aware of and one of them is debt I think the biggest risk for the UK is probably the level of debt this chart is rather colorful shows the total amount of non-financial debt relative to GDP so take out the financial businesses take out the banks and building societies let's look at households uh, and businesses corporates and you can see that there was a huge rise in debt before the last financial crisis in 2003 2005 2007 debt almost reached 180 percent of GDP then debt fell back obviously as the recession kicked in and people started to try and repay debt a little bit it fell but the last few years it stabilized at about 140 145 percent of GDP that green bit of student loans that's been going up quite sharply some signs that debt is pretty high 150 percent of GDP now in a world of low interest rates that debt is relatively easy to to afford to service but if interest rates start going up to any significant degree if unemployment stops falling if people's real income start to take a bit of a hit in the months and the years ahead then debt becomes much harder to repay I think we should have a lower level of debt than we do at the moment the other big risk is something called capital flight just a quick one on this <coughs> Pardon me. there are some risks to do with uh, something called the outflow of hot money which you may have come across if you studied exchange rates here's the basic flow through if overseas investors become nervous about the UK that might cause a big outflow of hot money uh, which causes sterling to depreciate of course sterling is a floating exchange rate the fall in the currency leads to a rise in inflation cost push weaker sterling then triggers the Bank of England to to raise interest rates let's say to two or three percent the higher inflation impacts on people's incomes that causes a fall in demand it also becomes more expensive for the UK government to borrow when they're issuing new debt so if the economy then slows down on the back of the rising interest rates 
that then increases the risks for commercial banks, some of whom have lent money to people who will find it very hard to repay. We call this the risks to the UK economy from capital flight. Last slide, and if you stayed with me all the way, thank you and well done, uh, is a fantastic quote from Andy Holden. So financial regulation can be a little dry. You need to know the basics. You need to know why we have regulation. But crucially, this is a great quote. The financial system is dynamic and adaptive. So any financial regulatory policy, if you like, will need to be adaptive if it's, if it's to contain risk within this system. In a sense, the regulators are having to run to stand still because lenders are becoming even more complex with how they lend their money out. Living in a world of financial technology, fintech, lots of new financial products on the near horizon, the role of online banking, all that kind of stuff. So uh, Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrencies, you might be interested in, in looking at that. How do you regulate Bitcoin if you can? So financial regulation is an interesting area. And it's one that you literally have to run to stand still because it's such a dynamic and adaptive market. There we go. Thank you for joining in this 2019 update on financial regulation. And I hope you got something tangible from it.